Welcome to the second episode on civil procedure. We hope you enjoyed our previous discussion on the letter of demand. If you have any questions regarding anything said in a particular episode, please leave a comment and we'll do our best to respond there too. In this episode, we are going to discuss everything one should know about the summons before proceeding to draft same. Once we get some important basics out of the way, we will move on to the drafting and content aspect of the three different types. Although the notice of motion is also important, it will be discussed in a separate video, but we will highlight the differences between the action and application procedure in this episode. We don't want to squash too many topics into a single episode. Guys, if you're enjoying this channel, please remember to subscribe and share with your colleagues. It would be much appreciated. If you guys want to enter a competition to win wine and beer, check out the link in the description below. T's and C's apply. What is a summons? A summons is a court-issued document which commences the litigious process. We prefer to consider the service of the summons as the step that commences the litigious process, but this is neither here nor there. The summons is addressed to the sheriff and directs said sheriff to serve the summons and explain the plaintiff's claim, the procedural steps and relevant time limits to be followed by the defendants to dispute the claim. The sheriff in question will be the relevant sheriff who has jurisdiction over the service addresses. You could be instructing several sheriffs depending on the number of defendants as well as the number of different addresses at which you will be serving the summons. There are three types of summonses, namely the simple summons, the combined summons, and the provisional sentence summons. Strictly speaking, there is another type of summons referred to as the interpleader summons but there are vast differences between this type of summons and the previous three mentioned. In fact, it doesn't feel right referring to the interpleader as a summons. The interpleader summons will not be discussed in this episode, but will be addressed in a later video. In practice, you will mostly draft combined summonses, sometimes draft simple summonses, and very rarely draft provisional sentence summonses. Nonetheless, let's briefly have a look at the three types of summonses, starting first with the most simple type, namely the simple summons. Sorry about that. The simple summons. What is a simple summons? As mentioned already, a summons is a court-issued document which commences the litigation process. This definition applies to the simple summons. A simple summons is a document which contains the particulars of the plaintiff's claim in the actual body of the summons. When we refer to the particulars of a simple summons, we mean the most obvious thereof. For example, the agreement, the breach, and the amount due to the plaintiffs by the defendants. Whereas a combined summons comprises the summons together with the particulars of claim, a simple summons does not have particulars of claim annexed there too. Do not get confused between particulars of the claim and particulars of claim. Particulars of claim is a pleading. Instead, as already mentioned, very brief particulars of the claim are included in the body of the simple summons itself. Therefore, as you can imagine, there is a limit to what can be claimed in a simple summons. This will be touched on in much greater detail shortly. If a notice of intention to defend is received after the service of the simple summons, the next step would be for the plaintiff, or the plaintiffs, depending on how many there are, to deliver a declaration. A declaration is the equivalent to the particulars of claim incorporated in the combined summons. When should I utilize a simple summons? In terms of Rule 17, Subsection 2 of the Uniform Rules of Court and Rule 5, Subsection 2b of the Magistrates' Court Rules, the simple summons may be issued where the claim is founded on a debt or liquidated demand. In our previous episode, we briefly touched on what a debt or liquidated demand is, but we are going to get deep with the expression now. Neither the Uniform Rules of Court nor the Magistrates' Court Rules define what a debt or liquidated demand is. To understand exactly what is meant by a debt or liquidated demand, take note of the following. 
A debt is defined as a certain sum payable in respect of a liquidated money demand recoverable by action. In Fatty's Engineering Co. PTY Limited versus Vendix Bears PTY Limited, it was held that a claim capable of speedy and prompt ascertainment is a debt or liquidated demand. In the past, our courts have considered the following claims to be for a debt or liquidated demand. Claims by an attorney for the payment of their fees and disbursements by a client represented by said attorney. Surprisingly, these claims are common. A claim for the repayment of an amount wrongfully and unlawfully stolen. A claim for payment of goods supplied or services rendered, provided the amount due is capable of speedy and prompt ascertainment. A claim for damages as a result of a contractual breach where the value of the contractual damage is a predetermined amount. And commercial ejectment of a tenant, not eviction in terms of pie. Take note that the above list is not exhaustive whatsoever. Take note further that the mere fact that a cause of action is based on an oral agreement does not render the claim illiquid. Some examples of claims that are not based on a debt or liquidated demand, divorce, maintenance, and delictual claims where the quantum must be proved. In light of the above, a simple summons will be utilized when the claim and the relief sought is relatively straightforward. For example, X sold Y a product for 1,000 Rand payable immediately. Y has taken possession of the product but has not paid to X the purchase price thereof. X will issue a simple summons and instruct the relevant sheriff to serve same on Y. Of course, most claims are not as straightforward as the aforementioned, and as such, a simple summons will not be viable. We, as attorneys, often prefer to play it safe and proceed with a combined summons, even when the claim is based on a debt or liquidated demand. What should a simple summons contain? Before we discuss the contents of the simple summons, it is crucial to note that a distinction needs to be made between the summons and the declaration. If a simple summons is defended, the plaintiff will have to serve a declaration, which is essentially the same as the particulars of claim that would be attached to a combined summons. We're firstly going to look at the simple summons, not the declaration. In a later episode, we'll be drafting each type of summons together, whereas the purpose of this episode is to understand the basics. The simple summons must contain the following. The heading of the summons, which will include the particulars of the court out of which it is being issued. For example, in the Magistrates Court for the District of Johannesburg North, held at Ramburg. Provision for the insertion of a case number, which you will receive when issuing the summons. This will be placed on the top right-hand side of the page directly under the court's particulars. The plaintiff's and the defendant's details. If the defendant is a natural person, include their ID number, and if they are a juristic person, include their registration number. Take note that there can be several plaintiffs and several defendants in a single summons. They would be cited as X, first plaintiff, Y, second plaintiff, Z, first defendant, and so on. The body of the summons, which will include to the sheriff or his or her deputy. Remember, the summons is an instruction to the sheriff. Citation of the defendants, including their full names, sex, residential, business address, and or employment address, and where known, their occupation should be stated. If they are being sued in a representative capacity, such capacity must be stated. We like to include as much basic information as possible. Citation of the plaintiffs, including their full names, sex, and occupation, and their residence or place of business, and where the plaintiff sues in a representative capacity, such capacity. Confirmation that the court has jurisdiction and the reasons why it has jurisdiction. Guys, jurisdiction is so important. Make 100% sure that the court you are issuing out of has the requisite jurisdiction to hear the matter. If it does not, you will not be successful, and if the matter is defended, you will be hit with a cost order. Jurisdiction will be discussed in a later episode. The relief sought, for example, payments of 1,000 Rand. Brief reason for the relief sought. Reference to the date on which a letter of demand, if applicable, was sent. State that, despite demand, the defendants have failed and or refused to comply. Attach a copy of the letter of demand to the summons. Reference to the liquid document relied upon, which must be attached as an annexure. This would be an invoice, statement of account, proof of payment, etc. The prayers. The prayers refer to the specific relief sought and could include payment of an amount, interest on said amount, 
and payments of legal costs on the applicable scale. This will also be discussed in more detail in a later episode. It is standard practice to include a prayer for further and or alternative relief. Instruction to the sheriff to inform the defendants that they may defend the action within 10 days as well as what the consequences are for failing to do so. In the magistrate's court, the summons must also contain a form of consent to judgment, a form of appearance to defend, a notice drawing the defendant's attention to the provisions of section 109 of the Magistrates' Courts Act, and a notice in which the defendant's attention is directed to the provisions of section 57, 58, 65A, and 65D of the Act, in cases where the action is based on a debt referred to in section 55 of the Act. The aforementioned will be explained in greater detail when we start drafting the summons. You must date and sign the summons. As the simple summons is not a pleading, it does not need to be signed by an attorney with rights of appearance or an advocate. If you have been admitted, you may sign the summons. As mentioned, should the plaintiffs receive a notice of intention to defend, they will be required to deliver a declaration. The contents of the declaration are exactly the same as the particulars of claim and next to the combined summons. Therefore, we will not be discussing both the declaration and particulars, as they are essentially the same document. If no notice of intention to defend is received, the plaintiffs are entitled to apply for default judgment without delivering a declaration. The Combined Summons What is a combined summons? As mentioned, the combined summons, also known as the ordinary summons, is the type of summons you will be drafting most frequently. The combined summons basically consists of two documents, namely the summons and the annexure to the summons known as the particulars of claim. Again, one needs to distinguish between the particulars of claim and the particulars of the claim. The former is a pleading. With regards to the simple summons, the declaration is only served should a notice of intention to defend be delivered, which means served and filed. Whereas with the combined summons, the summons and particulars of claim are conjoined and served as a single document. If a notice of intention to defend is received by the plaintiff, no declaration is delivered as the particulars of claim have already been set out in the combined summons. After the plaintiff is served with a notice of intention to defend, the next step would be for the defendants to deliver a plea with or without a counterclaim, application to strike out or an exception, but more on this another time. The particulars of claim contains the plaintiff's particulars of the claim. Pretty obvious, right? When should I utilize a combined summons? A combined summons may be used in respect of all claims. It is the use of the simple summons that has limitations. Although a simple summons may be issued in respect of a claim based on a debt or liquidated demand, so too can a combined summons. That is one of the reasons the combined summons is most commonly used. Attorneys often prefer utilizing the combined summons for most of their matters. Notwithstanding the aforementioned, a combined summons should be used in the following instances. When it is expected that the claim for a debt or liquidated demand will be defended, or if said claim is quite complex. When claiming damages, where the quantum of the damages needs to be established. When the claim is based on a breach of contract. When the relief sought is a declaratory order. When the claim is matrimonial in nature, such as a divorce. And all other claims not for a debt or liquidated demand. What must a combined summons contain? We already know that the combined summons consists of the summons and the particulars of claim, which is annexed to the summons. The summons? The summons will be the same as that of the simple summons, save for the fact that no particulars of the claim are mentioned and no relief is sought in the summons itself. It must, however, be mentioned in the summons that the plaintiff claims the relief on the grounds as set out in the particulars of claim annexed thereto. Therefore, instead of actually setting out the particulars in the summons, you instruct the sheriff to draw the defendant's attention to the annexed particulars of claim. Remember, the magistrate's court rules require a few additions to the summons, such as a form of consent to judgment, etc. This was already discussed under the simple summons. The particulars of claim. Take note that the following also applies to the contents of the declaration, which is only delivered when a simple summons is defended. We are not going to go into too much detail here, as we will be discussing and drafting the combined summons in an episode to be released soon. It is, however, crucial that the following is included in the particulars of claim. The nature of the plaintiff's claim and the details of the parties. Confirmation that the court has jurisdiction and the basis on which it has jurisdiction. 
the facts upon which the plaintiff relies to prove the claim, the conclusions of law that can be deduced from the facts, a prayer for the relief claimed. In addition to the contents of the particulars of claim, there will be annexures there too. Yes, there are annexures to the annexure of the summons. Uniform Rule 18, Subsection 6, and Magistrates' Court Rule 6, Subsection 6, states that a party who in his pleading relies upon a contract shall state whether the contract is written or oral, and when, where, and by whom it was concluded, and if the contract is written, a true copy thereof, or the part relied on in the pleading, shall be annexed to the pleading. In practice, it is not often that the contract is the only annexure to the plaintiff's particulars of claim. Other documents which are often attached to particulars of claim include, inter alia, the following statements, invoices, and proofs of payment, letter of demand and notices of cancellation or termination, and certain correspondence. But bear in mind that pleadings are about facts from which legal conclusions may be drawn, so the particulars must contain facts and not evidence. Remember what we said about the letter of demand, factor probanda and not factor probantia. Don't go and attach every document in your possession to your particulars of claim. These documents will become relevant at the discovery stage. Take note, if the plaintiff is suing the defendants in respect of two or more claims, for example, a rear rental and holding over damages, they must be separate in the summons. Do a claim A and claim B, or claim 1 and claim 2. Don't stress too much, however, we will get to this. Formalities of the combined summons. The formalities pertaining to pleadings in general, as found in Rule 18 of the Uniform Rules of Court and Rule 6 of the Magistrates' Court's Rules, also applies to the particulars of claim, as it is a pleading. A simple summons is not a pleading, nor is the summons part of the combined summons. Uniform Rule 18 and Magistrates' Court Rule 6 have the following effect on a combined summons. In the High Court, a combined summons shall be signed by both an advocate and an attorney, or in the case of an attorney who has a right of appearance in the Supreme Court, only by such attorney, or if a party sues or defends personally by that party. When we draft the particulars of claim in respect of a High Court matter, you'll see that provision is made for the signature of an attorney with right of appearance or an advocate. Right of appearance in the superior courts is usually obtained after being admitted for three years. In the magistrate's court, an attorney may sign the combined summons regardless of whether they have right of appearance in the high court. The title of the action describing the parties thereto and the number assigned thereto by the registrar shall appear at the heads of the summons, provided that where the parties are numerous or the title lengthy and abbreviation is reasonably possible, it shall be so abbreviated. This rule refers to the heading of the summons as described earlier in this episode. The particulars of claim shall be divided into paragraphs, including subparagraphs, which shall be consecutively numbered and shall, as nearly as possible, each contain a distinct averment. The particulars of claim shall contain a clear and concise statement of the material facts upon which the plaintiff relies for his claim with sufficient particularity to enable the defendants to reply thereto. Where a contract is relied on in the particulars of claim, the plaintiff must state whether the contract is written or oral, and when, where, and by whom it was concluded. And if the contract is written, a true copy thereof, or of the part relied on in the particulars of claim, shall be annexed thereto. It shall not be necessary in the particulars of claim to state the circumstances from which an alleged implied term can be inferred. When claiming division, transfer, or forfeiture of assets in divorce proceedings in respect of a marriage out of community property, the plaintiff shall give details of the grounds on which she claims that she is entitled to such division, transfer, or forfeiture. When suing for damages, the plaintiff shall set them out in such manner as will enable the defendants reasonably to assess the quantum thereof, provided that when suing for damages for personal injury, the plaintiff shall specify their date of birth, the nature and extent of the injuries, and the nature, effects, and duration of the disability alleged to give rise to such damages, and shall far as reasonably practically possible state separately what amount, if any, is claimed for a. medical costs and hospital and other similar expenses, and how these costs and expenses are made up, b. pain and suffering, stating whether temporary or permanent and which injuries caused it, c. disability in respect of the earning of income, stating the earnings lost to date and how the amount is made up, and the estimated future loss and the nature of the work the plaintiff will in future be able to do, the enjoyment of amenities of life, giving particulars, and stating whether the disability concerned is temporary or permanent, and disfigurement, with a full description thereof and stating whether it is temporary or permanent. When suing for damages resulting from the death of another, 
The plaintiff shall state the date of birth of the deceased, as well as that of any person claiming damages as a result of the death. The Magistrate's Court Rules contains the following further provisions. Where the plaintiff relies on an agreement governed by legislation, they shall state the nature and extent of their compliance with the relevant provisions of such legislation. And where the plaintiff sues as sessionary, they shall indicate the name, address and description of the sedent at the date of session, as well as the date of the session. The Provisional Sentence Summons What is a Provisional Sentence Summons? The third type of summons, namely the Provisional Sentence Summons, is the least frequently utilized form of summons. This type of summons is hybrid in nature, as it commences as an action, summons, then integrates into an application, which would be the hearing dates, the requirements to deliver the affidavit, and only if the defendant enters the principal case does it form part of the action procedure again, plea, etc. The provisional sentence summons calls upon the defendant to file an opposing affidavit and appear before court to admit or deny liability in relation to a liquid document. If the defendant files an opposing affidavit as aforementioned, the hearing date may be postponed for the plaintiff to file a replying affidavit. If the court is satisfied that the defendant is liable in relation to the liquid documents, it will grant provisional judgment, which means that the defendant will be ordered to pay the amount set out in the liquid documents and will not be permitted to defend the summons until payment has been made. If payment as aforesaid is made, the defendants are required to give notice of their intention to enter the principal case within two months of the provisional judgment being granted. Thereafter, they are required to deliver their plea within 10 days of giving such notice. If the defendant fails to satisfy the amount claimed and fails to give notice to enter the principal case, the provisional judgment becomes final. Should the defendant enter into the principal case, they can demand security to restituendo from the plaintiff against payment of the amount on the summons. If the plaintiff cannot provide acceptable security, they are not entitled to provisional relief and will only be entitled to payment once final judgment has been obtained. A demand for security is made to ensure that should the plaintiff be unsuccessful in the principal case, the provisional judgment amount will be paid back to the defendant. Should the court refuse provisional sentence, it may order the defendant to file a plea within a stated time and may make such order as to the cost of the proceedings as it may seem just. Once a court has ordered that the plea be delivered, the rules pertaining to pleadings, discovery, trial, etc. shall apply therefrom. Provisional sentence is a special procedure designed to give a plaintiff with a liquid document and prima facie proof of his claim a speedy judgment without the expense and delay that ordinary trial action entails. When should I utilize a provisional sentence summons? A provisional sentence summons may be issued when a client's claim is strictly based on a liquid document. The summons is mostly used if it is clear that the defendant will not be able to raise a valid defense. We know what a debt or liquidated demand is, but what is a liquid document? The courts have in the past determined the following to be a liquid document. A document which evidences by its terms and without resort to evidence extrinsic thereto, an unconditional acknowledgement of indebtedness in an ascertained amount of money, the payment of which is due to the creditor. The acknowledgement of debt or undertaking to pay on the document must be clear and certain on the face of the document itself, and no extrinsic evidence should be required to establish the indebtedness. A document wherein a debtor acknowledges over his signature, or that of his duly authorized agent, or is in law regarded as having acknowledged without his signature actually having been affixed thereto, his indebtedness in a fixed and determinate sum of money. Examples of a liquid document include, inter alia, acknowledgement of debt, checks, promissory notes, and bills of exchange. Take note that in Tuya Junger Gazellen PTY Limited vs. Land and Agricultural Development Bank, the Constitutional Court found that certain requirements of the provisional sentence procedure are inconsistent with the defendant's right to a fair trial, as defined in Section 34 of the Constitution. The main issues of concern to the Court were the provisional sentence rules pertaining to oral evidence, probability of success, and payment of the judgment amount to enter the principal case. The Court stated that the common law must be developed in this regard. For more information, have a read of the case law. What should a provisional sentence summons contain? The provisional sentence summons is a single document, just as the simple summons is. There is no particulars of claim annexed thereto. The type of summons also consists of a heading and a body. The heading of the summons will be exactly the same as that of a simple summons or combined summons. The body of the summons must include the following. An instruction to the sheriff, an instruction to the sheriff to serve the summons on the defendant, and inform them of the following. 
that they are called upon to pay the amount claimed or failing such payment to appear personally by counsel or by an attorney with rights of appearance on the day mentioned in the summons to admit or deny their liability. That if they deny liability for the amount, they must deliver, which is serve and file, an affidavit which must set out the grounds for the defence and in which the defendants admit or deny whether it is their or their agent's signature on the liquid document. That in the event of them not paying to the plaintiffs immediately the amount plus interest if applicable, and if they further fail to file the reference affidavit and or appear in court on the date mentioned in the summons, provisional sentence may be granted against them, but that against payment of the said amount, interest and costs, they will be entitled to demand security for the restitution thereof if the said sentence should thereafter be reversed. The summons must also contain a citation of the defendants and the plaintiffs as you would in other types of summonses. It must also set out the cause of action. Copies of all documents upon which the claim is founded are to be annexed to the summons and served with it, so you'll need to refer to these documents in the body of the summons. How do I know when to issue a summons instead of a notice of motion? Now that we have discussed each type of summons, let's look at the factors which determine whether to institute proceedings by way of the summons or by way of the notice of motion. Where reference is made to the summons in the segment, we are referring to whichever type is applicable. Remember, there are claims where, say for example, only one of the summonses can be utilised. Instituting proceedings by way of any of the three types of summonses is known as the action procedure. On the other hand, instituting proceedings by way of a notice of motion is known as the application procedure. We are not going to look at the differences between the two procedures, as you should already know this. It is also slightly irrelevant for the purposes of this episode. What is relevant, however, is knowing when to follow either procedure. When determining whether to proceed with action or application, consider the following. When to proceed with action. If oral evidence and witness testimony would be required. Action proceedings envisage the presentation of facts and evidence verbally in court during a trial. Where a litigant foresees that his opponent will raise material disputes of facts in response to the claim. If you foresee the matter proceeding to trial. When to proceed with application. If the matter can be decided on a consideration of affidavits alone, facts and evidence are presented in affidavits that will be read by a presiding officer before hearing arguments in court on the issues raised in the affidavits, when the dispute can be expeditiously determined on common cause facts, in other words, there is no material dispute of facts between the counterparties and mainly legal considerations at issue. Note, however, the dividing line between the two processes is not always well defined and often applications, properly bought, will unintentionally and inevitably raise disputes of fact. In this regard, take note of the Plascon Evans Paints Limited v. Van Rehoboek Paints PTY Limited judgment. The above probably does not provide a huge amount of assistance, but in practice you will become very familiar as to when to proceed with the action procedure and when to proceed with the application procedure. Examples of actions include inter alia, debt collection, divorce and claims for damages. Examples of applications include inter alia, evictions in terms of pie, sequestration and liquidations, rescissions of judgment, substituted service and edict or citation, and requests for guardianship. Guys, please note that we'll be looking at each summons in extensive detail later on in the series. We will go through drafting, procedure, etc. extensively. It is, however, crucial that you know and understand the contents of this episode before we get into the drafting aspect. As usual, if you have any questions, leave a comment below and we will do our best to respond. Please, if you enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button and share this channel with your friends. We also have a Facebook and Twitter page, so give us a follow there too. The links are in the description. Our website will be up soon as well. Bye.